This is Gippsland FM, your community connection, the place where you can find out about what's happening in the community. It's a united voice sharing what we've got going on in the region. And what we have today is an absolutely smashing day. The weather is beautiful. Looking at the radar here, it says that we've got a max of 20 and there's 10% chance of rain. But if I think if you look outside, it's pretty much there's no rain at all. It's so beautiful. But there is a possible shower tomorrow, although it is warming up. It's going to be top of 23. So fantastic out here as we head into spring. Spring has sprung. And and what a beautiful day it is at a time of the season where we're all feeling like that new energy out there. And this is Business, Wealth and Mental Health, a show that explores how thriving businesses, wise financial management and peaceful relationships are good for your mental health. And on today's show, I've got the wonderful, amazing Melissa Ferguson, longtime resident here. Melissa, how are you today? Hi, Damien. Thanks for having me. I'm good, thank you. Yeah, it's good to have you on the show. You've been very active in the community. Mm. But where did that come from? Let's jump in the Wayback Machine and talk about, you know, what is your history? You weren't originally from here, but you've been That's here for right. quite a long time. Yeah. And you've got a lot of different diverse experience in, in work. Mm. Uh, can you tell us a little bit? Take us back in time. What's oh, your history? Okay. Well, I actually grew up in Werribee in the western suburbs. Um, and when I left school, I went to study uh, wool and fibre studies oh, wow. and became a wool classer as mm -hmm. well and did a little bit of work with the shearing team. So what's a wool classer for people that may not know that? <laughs> so you basically assess the, the staples of wool for their strength and um, how much they can be used to be spun, etc. and the science behind it all, the fineness of the fibres. Yeah, so um, it's not just throwing it on a and No, there's a lot it. involved and I actually really miss the wool industry. I, have a soft spot for it forever, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of. Um, so with the crimp in the fibres, will tell you the fineness of the actual fibre itself, and that it has to be classed into oh, wow. different sections to go into the bales. Fantastic. Mm. Yeah. And so you you worked in that, then you kind of missed it a little bit. And then yeah. where did you go? What brought you to this region? Well, from there I went into the manufacturing side um, and uh, started working in areas where it developed a product called Colada, which is a mixture of wool and cotton. Okay. Um, to when the wool industry was starting to sort of falter a little bit. And uh, the laboratory in Tullamarine that I worked in, we um, developed different types of um, dyes. So I'd do like the laboratory work, simulating what the factories did. Yep. Um, and I'd also done that in the wool processing plants as well, just on a smaller scale within the laboratory to get the right product to, to sell overseas. So mm. there's a lot of research and development by the sounds of it. Yeah. Did you enjoy that? I loved it. Absolutely loved it. What was it, it about it, the, the research and development? I'm just a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Welcome to the convention um, yeah. of super nerds. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you do not. Um, really nerdy stuff, science stuff. Yeah, I'm, I like it a lot. And um, I originally went for it because I'd not long lost my father when I was younger. And oh, he'd okay. always said to me, you know, well, it's a great job as a wool classer because he'd grown up on a wool wheat and sheep farm. Yeah. And I guess he'd always seen that as the epitome of jobs, you know. Yeah. Um, and I did it for him. So I went and studied it. And so how old were you when you, your father passed? 17. So, wow. Yeah. How yeah. was that in your life? Um, it was a big, big impact. Yeah. Um, he was uh, everything, my best friend yeah. um, and father. Yeah. So it was a big impact. I had to grow up fast. Yeah. <laughs> and I just had to stand on my own feet. Um, I still had my mum with me, but... I wanted to move to the country. I was more like my dad had that countryside in him more. Yeah. Um, and then I moved up to Gippsland when I was about 24. So was that part of the reason why you, you moved? Was I your father so. passing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just it was it to reconnect in a way? I think so. I think it was. Um, well, funnily enough, I did all that study in wool and sheep and then moved to cow country. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was sort of hoping to get laboratory jobs up here and that maybe, but there wasn't a lot about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I did feel a sense of peace in the country. Um, of course, when my parents first moved out to places like Werribee, that was country. Yes, and it just true. grew into city around them. Yeah. Um, but it got too busy for me there. So, yeah. Yeah. so what was that, that motivation? Was it any particular reason for tro choosing the Trobe City? Um, I just I had visited a rally up here and I really mm. liked it. Yeah. Um, and I fell in love with all the green hills. And I've always dreamt of places like Ireland. So <laughs> I saw the gifts that I'm like, it's as close as I'm going to get. So, so yeah. <laughs> I'm just having drink, have drinking flashbacks now. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> but is it, when you say that, because it's interesting how you say you, you came here and you found it was very beautiful. And I, mm. I find that when I speak to people a lot, they have that same experience. They've got a perception yes. of what the region is like. 
but mm-hmm. when they come, they have a very different perception. Is that was that your experience as well? Yeah, I don't think I knew what to expect. Um, most of our um, holidays when I was young were to central Victoria, where a lot of my family were, around Avoca, Mirabara, um, Birchett, places like that. So I'd only been used to sheep, wheat, country mainly. Yeah. Um, and then when I laid eyes on Gippsland and its greenery, yeah. I felt another sense of beauty because I still find that sense of beauty elsewhere as well. Yes. Um, but I had never seen like these rolling hills and what amazed me is around every single corner is a whole new landscape. Yeah. <laughs> it was like a little mystery world. Yeah. Well, it's and it has re- and a lot of diversity and you've talked about this before mm-hmm. in some of the conversations we've had that we have some of the most dense diversity in the world. Is that right? I believe so, yeah. yeah. And the, bio, the biodiversity in particular around Moa National Park that I mentioned is phenomenal. If you talk to the friends of Moa National Park, they actually have a walk on soon for the orchids and yeah. koala count. Um, and they're taking people through. If anyone would be interested in seeing that, um, they'd be able to tell you much more than well, I can. How can people find out about that? Um, I've actually shared that on my Facebook page today. Yeah. My Facebook page, the real one, <laughs> is Citizen Melissa Ferguson. Um, from when I unfortunately I was suspended yeah. and I can't change it back to councillor, so it's just Citizen Melissa Ferguson. Yeah. If you could follow to that page, then you'll see that I've shared a link today for their walk. Oh, fantastic. Mm. And so with that, you obviously have a passion for the the region and you've been a councillor before, mm. but you also, you're a mum as well. Yeah. And you also work. Yep. Part of what we've talked about off, um, cam- well, I'm going to say camera because we've got cameras rolling as well, but off air, <laughs> was... Um, that the balancing of work, life, counsellor mm. and all that stress <laughs> that goes with that because yep. politics is not always friendly. It's not and I have been through a big journey and at the time I was also the sole carer of my mother, my elderly mother who passed last December unfortunately, oh. um, but I had some the opportunity to be alongside her um, for her last years and the fact that I was trying to juggle that plus homeschooling my child plus council and plus all the dress from council, <laughs> uh, I don't know how I survived that. <laughs> um, but, well. Yeah, it was pretty much running from one thing to the other every day, day in, day out. Um, but I don't regret any of it. Being a, a carer is only a unique experience that a carer can ever really understand. Um, but I think there is an, a, a demographic of women now that are facing that challenge. And men. There's yeah. men are carers too. I shouldn't say just women. Yeah. Um, and they've got to balance that with I work. I think people are, most people are yes. responsible enough or mature enough to understand that when you say one, you actually are inclusive of everybody. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay, we can just leave it at that really. I it's think It's quite so. simple. Yeah. yeah, so when you're the carer, um, you have a unique experience, but you do have to balance your own family and work around that. Um, it's not something everyone can understand until they live it. So what, because as you mentioned, there are a lot of people that are experiencing that today mm. and there is a lot of stress out there and obviously cost of living is going up and people mm-hmm. are experiencing that pressure as well. Mm-hmm. Is there any tips that you, now when you look back and go, well, that, that actually helped or if someone was asking you that you'd say, look, these are certain things to help take care of your, your mental health and, and deal with these pressures? I think stoicism has helped me through yeah. life the most. I'm a subscriber to that. Yeah. So explain and, uh, that a little bit about... Well, just the a, the ability to look back and look at things philosophically and yeah. separate emotion from it as much as possible. It's not always possible. Yeah. Sometimes you can get dragged into the emotion at the time. Yeah. But the ability to, to bring yourself back philosophically and look at things um, as they are and accept them as they are, um, I think is one of the most powerful things in the world. Is that part of accepting what you can't change but focusing on what you can change? I believe so, and understanding that even if something's a way that you wish would change, maybe it's that way for a reason, and perhaps down the line you'll understand why you had that experience, but not right now. It's interesting that you mention that, because when I was younger, there was a job that I really, really wanted to get, or in a firm that I really, really wanted to, to work for, and it was very flash, and the office was very nice, and I didn't get the job. And I was really distraught about that and upset. Yeah. And then I ended up getting another job in the same industry with another firm. Yeah. And I found out that the firm that I didn't get the job for were known as Dodgy Brothers. And had oh. I got the job, I would have been labelled with that. And that would have been your whole career. Yeah. So, how, shot. Yeah. Yeah. so how do you, I mean, when you talk about that stoicism mm. and accepting things are, are, are 
what they are, mm. but also having that mindset of, because you mentioned it happens for a reason. How, mm. do, how do you do that in the moment? Um, in the moment, that is the challenge. It really is. And we, when, no one could say they do that perfectly. Everyone has their dark moments. Everyone has their dark times and their lifetimes. Yeah. But I think it's just sheer determination and stubbornness <laughs> that gets us through. And and people may dislike your stubbornness and your and your determination, but that's probably because they can't control you. But you still get through things anyhow. So that's how I believe. And I think that my my parents were great um, great leaders in the household. And we're not just leaders in the workforce; we're leaders in the household as well. And dad had the dad and mum both had a compassionate, charitable heart, mm-hmm. and they gave that to me also. Yeah. Um, but they were also stoics. Um, having their own health problems and unable to actually work and be on welfare, um, they battled through the best they could yeah. with four kids, and it gave me an example of absolute stoic resilience. So, so part of that resilience is yeah. just just facing those problems and keeping moving forward. Is that what you yeah, you experienced from your parents? Definitely, and I actually have some invisible illness myself. Yeah. Um, so I had the best example of that with mum and dad. They just got up every day, had their routine lived their lives, lived with good morals and good respect. And I just couldn't have had a better example on how to value the important things in life. Where does gratitude fall within that? Because when we look at things, you know, we can go, oh, you know, how, how our life sucks. Yeah. But then if we put it in perspective, certainly in, in Australia, and when we look even, you know, in La Trobe Valley, we're part of, which is part of Australia. Mm. <laughs> yes. <obviously. laughs> yeah. But we look at it, I mean, we're in the top, percentage of yeah, even in our worst parts we're better off than a lot of other people around the world that's correct how do we how do you keep that perspective Perspective. um keeping that perspective isn't always easy i mean when we're in our darkest times and people are full of depression and anxiety you can sense you just naturally can center on self too much Mm -hmm. but i think charity and, and volunteerism is a very big tool to getting away from that and being outside of yourself and helping others that is the best way to heal, I believe. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I hear that a lot where people say, if you're feeling down or depressed, mm-hmm. go and help somebody else and all of a sudden it shifts that. But is that what you experienced as well? I did. I, I've just always been that way. When I was younger, I was always in the local St John ambulance and things like that. I was always volunteering from yeah. quite young. Um, and my mum my always volunteered at the St Vincent de Paul op shop and things like that. So I didn't know any different. I just thought that was part of life. You give back to your community in some way. Mm. But as I've got older, the understanding the true value of that is irreplaceable. And I'd find that you'd meet people on your journeys who had been through similar traumas or experiences just by volunteering alone. So the wealth of understanding that you get from others among that is worth what you're giving because you always somehow as a volunteer get more back than what you've ever given, even though it doesn't feel like it would be possible it is. And with that volunteering, because you've been involved a lot within the community, yes. and uh, even going be, uh, going before the council at the time as well, you were very involved with um, the, the bushfire, uh, yes. helping with that, getting mm-hmm. food out, that kind of thing. Tell us about that. Where, where, where did that, that stem from? Um, well, I'd, I'd uh, taken, um, so I'd started off in the agricultural and science sort of area, and then I moved into studying my diploma of community services and counselling. Um, and I used the um, vocational training that I'd had, a big believer in vocational training. Yeah. Um, and I took that and applied that to what I could see was happening at the time in the dairy industry and when the price first, first fell in 2016. And I'd saw so many smaller family farms and been part of one where it was no longer viable. Mm. Um, and I can see that that's still an ongoing pattern and struggle for smaller farms. Um, and I wanted to help them so because uh, farmers are very proud they won't go in and look for a food hamper they'd rather starve than naturally admit it so I've designed a system where we actually found them and it was by anonymous referral by friends and family yeah and then we would secretly go out and give them a food hamper and so knock on the door and run away (laughs) (laughs) that's it and most of the time they're just so appreciative because they didn't have to reach out yeah. Um, but at the same time, they knew someone cared because it would be very isolating on properties. Yeah. Um, so that all started, and I just started that from the kitchen table, and then it evolved into a not-for-profit organisation and eventually to a charity. 
um, Gippsland oh, Farmer so, Relief. So it actually developed yes. into a, a mm. proper charity. Wow. That's right. So we went, you know, first of all, the incorporate association stage, and then yeah. I put all the policies in place to make it a, a proper charity. Yeah. And um, then we did the bushfire program at, as part of that. Yeah. Mm. So a lot of people probably don't know that from your experience. I mean, because I, I, I know from being involved with charities myself, and I've been a CEO of a charity, mm. there's a lot of work in getting them up and running. It was, and um, it was all voluntary that I did that for four years and built it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so circumstances changed, but I did. I built an actual charitable foundation for, for our farmers, and the whole idea behind that was... Um, based on this history of some of my family history and understanding how when countries can go under, the first thing will go is your small family farms yeah. um, and how important they are to keep the food security and that knowledge um, in place was probably one of the other reasons I was trying to do that. Um, so, yeah, it was quite an interesting thing. That's another thing I don't think people realise, how mm -hmm. fragile all this that we have. The things that we have, mm -hmm. when you talk about food security, talk about energy, those kind of things are extremely fragile and take a yes. lot to manage. That's and right. for someone like you to go to that effort voluntarily mm -hmm. and set up a charity, because uh, had you set up a charity before? No. Um, and How it's did just you learn a, what to do? Um, I've always just been a big believer in self-education where you don't know something anyway. Um, that, was, that was my dad probably tell me just to, if you want to know something, either pick someone's brain or you find a book on it. Um, and that's sort of paid <laughs> off in advice. 80 years, is right? <laughs> now we've got Google, he would have loved it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just sort of find my own ways, but I did have some mentors along the way as well. Yeah. Um, but mainly it was just all from a place of compassion and just intuition and following my feelings and, and what I thought was right um, and trying to design things effectively. Wow. So, and I'm still blown away that you, you know, you, again, knowing, you know, when I look at what we did, we had, you know, a lot of money behind us, a lot of people yes. with a lot of experience, but you've done this by yourself. Yeah. Well, I can never say I was by myself, though. I had a big team yep. and they all contributed. And I think what helps is I'm a democratic leader. So okay. we all did it together as far as I'm, I'll always be concerned. You know, yeah. I don't ever take the credit without saying and they probably will listen to this a lot of my volunteers from back then and I still love them and they still love me and we're still like family from that time um and I yeah it just, just sort of evolved and I guess I, I love being a leader and I like growing people that I work with as well mm. and then when people feel valued what they can do is amazing tell us about yeah. that the democratic leader you mentioned that term mm. what what is a democratic leader well, I never see myself above anybody, you know, so when I'm working with people, um, of course I understand I'm in the role of a CEO at the time or, you know, in a not-for-profit sense, CEO, yeah. um, but I, everyone's equal to me and my work is of value and I tend to love meeting a new worker or a new volunteer and working out, talking to them and working out what their skills and strengths are yeah. and then finding something that they can do and then just watching them bloom in that role. Like, oh, that's honestly something I really miss. <laughs> um, and do people yeah. respond to that? Do they want that kind of encouragement? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, just yesterday I had an ex-volunteer talking to me, um, obviously keeping this um, <laughs> without names, and she said that, you know, she's got great ideas and frustrated in her role because she can't put them forward because this boss may feel it's a threat. Yeah. You know, and I hear that a lot from my ex-volunteers and staff. Mm. that they get frustrated in their further roles because they were used to someone that was open to their ideas and, and then to go into a next place and they're a bit stifled or held back is confusing. Yeah. And I wonder about that, what you're talking about there, because it seems like you know, when I'm out talking with people, I'm getting the same thing that you're getting. There's yeah. a lot of people wanting to do stuff. Yes. But then you have the other side, and we're going to come into the council now, mm. and, um, and we've got people within the council saying, oh, people don't volunteer. But if you don't create the environment where you're encouraging them to volunteer, you may not, you, know, you might have to let go of your view of the world. Is it, in, and this is why I'm picking your brain on your leadership yes. skill, because you, you might have had an idea of how to do things. Yes. But then someone's come up with a better idea. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, if that happens, it happens. I just incorporate that in and go, well, that's a great idea. <laughs> I, don't, I don't hold ownership over something. Yeah. So if people want to contribute to it, evolve it, I'm never going to stop that. 
Yeah. You know, I think that everyone has something to contribute. And I think if you don't have that egotistical hold over the council or anything that's done in it, then you welcome new people with new ideas. And is that how you see when you look at the democratic leader? The democratic leader is someone that has that bigger vision, mm. but they're not holding it to the, the day-to-day of how it's done or, or how they get to go, well, this is the goal, this is the objective. Maybe I'll put it this way. This is mm. the objective. We want to get to here. Mm. But how we get there is a collective response. Is that where you, you're pointing towards? I'd love to say I analysed it to that point, but I just do it. Yeah. <laughs> and it just seems to naturally happen. Um, and I think it's it just sort of happens when you're good to people. And I was very good to, I mean, of course, you couldn't say you've been a CEO and haven't had a couple of people that you couldn't please. Yeah. Okay, so that does happen. But luckily for me, that's been a minute few. Yeah. And most people will respond when you give the opportunity to bloom. They'll just naturally do it. Mm. Um, and if you give them, if, you know, well, it was hard because I didn't really have resources because we never got funded yeah. for admin or anything. Yeah. Um, so that's a big problem in Gippsland. The wrong places don't get funded. I'll just add that in. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, whatever you like. Yeah, can't help it. Um, yeah, so, you know, once you, you, you try and give someone that opportunity, I find most people just want to do good. And mm. they'll do good with all their skills and their natural talents. We just got to encourage them and tell them that's well done. It's quite simple to me. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's just being nice to people. Um, and not worrying if other people outshine you. A big thing with leaders is if they can't have someone that's more talented or more experienced around, then forget about whatever you're working on growing. Well, the best <laughs> leaders, from what I've seen, you Henry Fords and all those type yeah. of people, Mary Barra at GM, yes. they, they talk about how the, their success is about surrounding themselves with people smarter than them. Yes, I think there's a lot to say from that. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't even think if someone's smarter or less smarter. Everyone's got something to offer, mm. and if they are smarter, then great. I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to do what my dad said and pick their brain and learn everything I can. And then I learned in later years you've got to be careful whose brain you pick because it's not always right. Um, but then I learned to decipher that, and then I think most of my self-education has come from just talking to people. Let's talk about that part where you mentioned that there's some people that you can't please. Yeah. You now, you've, you've had that experience <laughs> where some people disagree, and if you have an yeah. opinion, it doesn't matter who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody's going to have an opposite opinion. That's right. And how have you learned to deal with that? Because a lot of us, you know, naturally I think we want to be liked. And mm-hmm. if someone doesn't have, you know, if someone is harsh to us, we can get a little bit defensive sometimes. And mm-hmm. how have you learned to deal with that? Um, it's taken me a long time because when you when you are naturally a loving and in- encouraging person, it can you can take it to heart. Because yeah. you're obviously a sensitive person to be able to assess these things in people and everything as well. But as I said, with stoicism and probably my mum insisting that I become stoic like her because she was a really hard Irish background woman. <laughs> she, stoicism was in her veins and it's in mine too. And it's awakened now. And the more the more trials and tribulations you go through, the more you awaken that ability to philosophically disconnect from your hardships and your challenges. And I think that, you know, by having people that are a, a different opinion has never actually bothered me. I've, I can be friends with absolutely anybody from any walk of life with a different opinion. Mm. Um, the only exceptions I have to that is when it's about the harm of other people. Yeah. Um, but other around anything ap- apart from anything like that, I can be... Is that part of where innovation comes from, by having yeah. that ability to have someone with a dis- diff- voice a different mm. opinion and then having the ability to listen to that and see mm. how you can incorporate that is that yeah, something definitely. That you... oh definitely um i mean if you're not evolving and changing as a human being there's something wrong mm. but if you're being told that you're not willing to evolve and um um and grow because it's against your values that's a whole different kettle of fish mm. so for someone to get to that because you sounds like you've had to learn that as well. Mm. You, you had some good mentors and your parents that, that guided you through yes. that. How would you help someone in that situation? What advice would you give them to say, look, you know, this is how we can step back, how we can actually have different opinions mm. and still behave civilly? Yeah, well, you know, some situations people can push you and push you to don't behave civilly for a moment. And then you can pull yourself back in the line like I have um, and learn from that. 
Um, but mostly it's just sitting back and what I've always tended to do naturally anyway is look at somebody and in my head I'll mentally draw up a lifeline of what I know about their life, mm -hmm. their circumstances, even their family dynamics, what their um, partnerships appear like and I can sort of fundamentally from that draw on why they may be acting the way they are and I try to have a deeper understanding behind that. I try that with everyone. <laughs> yeah. That's good advice. We've got about a minute to go. If we're gonna, if you were to leave the audience with some key learnings, advice, things that you wanted to share with the audience, what would that be? Believe in yourself and and don't let anybody um, make you feel bad about yourself because we are all equal and we all have our role to play. Melissa, thank you very much for, for coming on the show, sharing that advice, sharing some of the, the personal stories uh, about you and, and helping other people is greatly appreciated and look for, looking forward to more chats in the future. No worries. Thank you so much. It was enjoyable. Thank you.